All right, good morning, good morning. Welcome to the Hayes Public Library. My name is Jeremy Gill. I'm the Kansas Room Coordinator here at the library. We have a special presentation this morning. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Deborah Bolton for a presentation on Indigenous Ecology by using the book Breeding Sweetgrass as a Guide. I know many of you have already picked up a free copy of this book, which was provided uh, for free uh, through, through a grant, which is wonderful. We actually have one more copy left, so I guess whoever wants to fight for it can. Okay, we have a taker. This presentation is brought to you by Humanities Kansas and the Hayes Public Library. And we'd also like to thank the Schmidt Foundation for providing funds for this particular program, and that is why it is being used in this space here, which is the Schmidt Community Commons. Dr. Bolton is the Director of, the, of Intercultural Learning and Academic Success and a faculty member in the Department of Geospatial Sciences at Kansas State University. And we are more than welcome to have her here this morning. So please welcome Dr. Bolton. Thank you. Thank you. And I noticed there are people sitting way in the back over there, so I hope you can hear. I noticed that we're in the new fiction section, but this book is absolutely not fiction, and so it's a good thing. Before we get started, I always like to acknowledge the land that we're on, and right here we're in the land of the Kaw, and the Kiowa, and the Pawnee, and the Comanche, and the Ute, the Uncompahgre. So it's nice, because I'm part Ute, and so uh, we always talk about the people on this land first. Currently, Kansas is home to four federally recognized native nations, the Kaw, the Osage, the Kickapoo, and the Iowa of uh, Kansas and Nebraska. Remembering that a lot of nations were moved through these parts to make ways for settlers, and if you look back at the uh, May of 1862 in the land, uh, the Homestead Act, you will notice that it was homestead for certain people, but not others. And that was 1862. Uh, Native people weren't considered human by the Congress until 1872, so non-humans couldn't have the land. And of course, we were fighting over owning other humans, so they couldn't own the land. So uh, again, that was kind of an exclusionary act. <coughs> I work for a land grant institution. That's July of 1862 and itself was an exclusionary act because it said education for the common man. In 1862, try to remember who the common man was. It was a lot of people. When I'm on Zoom, I'll even tell you where Zoom elect, uh, has erected its headquarters, and so we're not on Zoom, so I don't have to tell you that. I don't think we're on Zoom. We could be. Here I am, Gawati Oba, Shie Dr. Deborah Bolton, initiate Okiawenge Dene Ankampagre. I just introduced, I wish you health, and um, the, uh, the Okiawenge are what Spanish settlers called the San Juan Pueblo, and they're the ones that named us Pueblo. And then they also named the Navajo, which meant people of the planted fields, which was Dene, and then the Ankampagre would have changed to you when settlers moved into. Utah, Fort Duchesne, Utah, the Four Corners region, and southern uh, Utah, are just south of Durango, Colorado. Interesting thing to note about the people and the settling of this country, I think a lot of people don't understand. Spain made it to what is now New Mexico in 1535. The Plymouth Rock Landing didn't happen until 1620. So we were this close to being a Spanish-speaking country. Spain went south. They didn't reach the Aztec Empire until 1551. So the only reason Meso, Central, and South America speak Spanish and the Caribbean is because of Spain. Now we speak English because um, first Dutch settlers came escaping religious persecution from Holland and then the English settlers came. And I think we often forget that and we certainly are not teaching it anymore in our history and we don't teach what all those kinds of things that happen. So I tell my students, if you want to start reading about the exclusionary laws that created this country, look at the Federalist Papers, 10 and 12. Look at the Articles of Confederation, 
and the U.S. Constitution, because we're named in all of those as people who needed, as things that needed to be raised. So just to let you know that, I am a geographer. I'm an English teacher also, but uh, geography is my passion. Also, I guess uh, editing is another passion, and writing, of course, is another passion. But I'm here to talk to you today. We're going to talk a little bit about human socialization. Why are we going to do that? Because I, I find that it's often missing. And I do present vocabulary because I find it's often missing in what we teach. And then we'll talk a little bit about sovereignty. But let's talk first about our socialization. Everything we learn is the moment we're born. Our cultural ideals are transmitted through facial, through voice, through action, through words, through touch, all of those kinds of things. And those, that's our first sphere of influence. And why am I telling you all this? Because it'll make sense as we start talking about the book. Um, and then we go to school, and we go out into our faith communities, again, starting to transmit our cultural ideals. So when we're in community and in home, we have this very individualized experience. And then when we get out in the world, we go to school, we go to work, we start getting shared experiences because we adapt and we adopt all the time. And, and those become our cultural ideals. And so if you look at the dominant cultural patterns because of settler colonialism, dominate nature. We live in western Kansas. How do, how do we dominate nature here? Huh? Farming. How does farming dominate nature? Trade is what happens. Trade is the soil. And what are we doing with the water in the aquifer? Using it up. Extracting it. <laughs> so if we extract an acre foot a year out of the Ogallala, and it only recharges a quarter of an inch, with that knowledge, do you think we would find better ways to raise crops and animals? So it's not a political thing. It is actually true. If you talk to the hydrologist, they'll tell you how much is extracted. And I know that Hayes has been on a water band for quite some time. You can't have lawns here, right? No, we can have lawns. Oh, now you can have it's lawns. It's just restricted in the summer to water uh, okay. during the hot tide. When I, I lived here for two summers in 2001 and 2002, and I remember people could only zero escape. Oh. Yeah, so I was getting my master's in English here and would come in the, in the summer program. So that's one way. Very goal bound, I get that. Work hard, control the future, engage autonomous in constant activity though. When I'm evaluated every year, I don't, I'm not evaluated on who I teach, what they learn, and what were the outcomes, who I graduated. I'm still evaluated on how much I did. And a lot of times you'll see that in your own evaluations back in the day when, if you're, you're retired. But we don't talk about, okay, whose life did you change because of your teaching? Or how much did you do? Yeah, so that's kind of that um, concept. Now, if you look at collective cultural patterns, still working with nature, still surviving, interact, but as she talks about in the book, never fully extract. You always leave 50% behind. And she, she talks about that in the sweet grass and how she re did research on cutting it versus pulling it out. Okay, so sweet grass does well by pulling it out by its roots. And thank you, what's your name? Diana. Hi, Diana, thank you. Diana brought us some sweet grass if you want to smell it. It also has its roots, so if you want to take it home and propagate it and plant it, now's the time to plant it because then it'll frostbite or freeze and it'll go down and the roots will start uh, gaining. So now's a good time to do that. And then it'll start growing really well. We always plan for our lives, but relationships are our currency before folding money came upon us. Relationships is a currency. The use of the land is the currency. You don't overuse the land. You only use 50% and you move on. So we move, not because we couldn't stop our roaming ways, as the governor of Colorado said about the youth. You've got to stop your roaming ways. We, you, we moved so that we didn't overuse the land. So you only take 50%. She really talks about that, so that it gives back. 
Um, so, just some questions you might answer. I'll come back to those. We already talked about that. Um, I talk about culture because sometimes people don't understand that we learn our cultures. It's not like we're born with them or anything like that. It evolves and grows. This is a cultural aspect. It's planted, you grow it, and then you, you harvest it. And she talks a lot about the, what she call it, um, the honorable harvest. Honorable harvest means you don't take it all. Um, I'm from Western Colorado, and uh, asparagus grows everywhere. But in the last 20 years, we've had a huge influx of people from California and people from Texas, and a lot of people who just want to live in Colorado. Well, they discovered, they discovered, and remember, discovery no one means you didn't know it was there, like Columbus, he just didn't know it was here. <laughs> he also thought he was in, you know. <laughs> so anyway, um, so what they discovered, oh, this, this uh, asparagus just goes wild, let's pull it out, let's take it. They didn't know you cut asparagus, because it needs to go the next year. You cut it while they were pulling it out. So we can't find asparagus in our ditches anymore like you used to be able to. Plus, they didn't like all those weeds growing in the ditches, so let's kill it. Okay, so that happens too. And you know, we just don't understand sometimes what the people were doing to sustain life. And it's because we didn't understand it, we can't tend to say, oh, it's not valuable. Culture is not in your blood. Everything you know today, the lens you see through, is something you learn. And you can unlearn it too. So here's this vocabulary I talk a lot about. Because when people ask me questions, I think, OK, you're not, you're not asking me the real question. Um, culture, practices, and beliefs. There is a human alive on this land that doesn't have a, a more than one, cultural identities. So today you're book readers. So your ethnicity is that you're all book readers. That's the thing that you have in common. That's a common characteristic. That's what ethnicity means, a common characteristic in a group. So book readers as an ethnicity. Um, nationality, simply the country of your birth and or your citizenship. So when someone comes and says, what's your nationality? I say, U.S. America, uh, American. But what's your nationality? U.S. American. <laughs> because they don't understand, they think it's all interchangeable. What they really want to know is my ancestry. Or another one I like is, you speak English really good. How long have you been here? <laughs> I speak English well. It's the language of my colonizer, but about 13,000 years, I don't know. <laughs> Give or take. Um, so anyway, just understanding. This is probably the big one. Race, purely a social construct. Aristotle first started writing about race to give people a place to put people in class, to justify slavery. And so a lot of biologists took from him, I was a biology major at one time, and I just loved Linnaeus. He gave us binomial nomenclature. He gave us taxonomy, but he also wrote a lot of, of treatises on the natural slave. So this concept that if you were from an extreme climate, you probably had dark skin, and it meant you couldn't rule yourself. To think of all of the centuries we've been thinking that somehow there were minor people in this world. But humans are connected genetically 99.6% identical genetic code in all humans on this earth. 99.6%. Where we diverge is our geographies and interacting with our environments. This thing just changes on its own. <laughs> I don't know why I've taken all the transitions out of it. Okay, I think we, we beat that one anyway. We beat that dead horse already. But what I like is Brene Brown. If I have to be like you, I fit in. If I get to be myself, I, um, I belong. So, and inclusion, people talk about it, um, that a lot but I don't think we really understand the history of exclusion in those concepts. Um, these are all the laws and theories that favored and excluded specifically to Native Americans. It's a noise. 
Okay, look at all of these things. 1492, Doctrine of Discovery, Civilization Act, Indian Removal Act, Manifest Destiny. You have to do it all on your own now. <laughs> oh, oh that it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I didn't like the getting close to it. All of these different things. Uh, have any of you seen um, Killers of the Flower Moon or read it? Yeah, I'm not ready to see it myself, but I'm, it's a story that has to be told. So all through here, during tribal protection, any time a native population might have come upon some money, a protector was sent in. In 1933, the Navajo Nation, which had lots of sheep doing well, an extension agent came on and said, well, they're over uh, grazing the land. So the Congress ordered the slaughter of 600,000 sheep, which, which, which plummeted the nation into poverty. And again, I'm, I'm setting the stage for the book and we will discuss it. Quickly now, if you, if you look up Native American or anybody else, you'll find, like if you looked up on Google, I think this was from Bean, La, uh, Latino, Hispanic American, I don't know how that got in there, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you look up Asian American, this is what you get. If you look up African American, this is what you get. But do a Google search on Native American, and this is what you get, pre-1900 context. And I put an X between this, because that's just wrong there, because they're just dressed up. And, and there was this thing about hypersexualizing Native women, and so that's something we, we kind of work against. So if you only saw Natives in a pre-1900 context, put that in perspective. What if we saw colonial settlers only in a pre-1900 context. It would be way out of, out of whack, right? Whoops. Okay, so then in the movies, representation. We couldn't find a native to play Hawkeye, so we have to go to Ireland. He's a great actor. Yes, I'll admit that. And of course, we promote this guy as the savior in this whole group. And we do have a native actor. She's not native. She's from North Dakota. She sounded like uh, Canadian, but here he is, and we see him in this context. But in Canada, where he's from, he's known as a funny comedian. Did any of you ever see Red Green Show? Do you remember Edgar Montrose? <laughs> I loved his character because he was deaf. He was missing the ears because he was an ammunition. He was a munitions expert, self-taught. So of course, <laughs> just the funniest guy, though. Uh, so you know, seeing them beyond that. We are making way, though. We got movies. Um, someone was asking about Ryan, or Alex Redcorn and Ryan Redcorn. Ryan Redcorn's on our campus. We're having a reception for his, his photography exhibit and his artwork at the Mariana Kisper Beach Museum on the campus of Kansas State University. And so he wrote a couple of the, the episodes of Reservation Dogs. And, um, and these are positive images that we have of natives. We have some clarifying terms. We kind of ask not to use, uh, well, consider nation. We're not Indians. We'll still say that about ourselves. We'll say it to each other. Like if we say something stupid, we'll go, oh, Indian. <laughs> so we have our little. But um, a lot of people say, well, why did you all speak different languages? How's that for a question? I said, well, um, because we were different nations. Look at what is now the United States. And if you consider that as long as we've been on this land, we had our communities, but what was, how was it for uh, communication? How much could you really bleed over into each other's uh, cultural ideals, language, those kinds of things? So you'll see very different languages among the nations. From here, you can see there probably had a thousand, around a thousand indigenous nations on these lands at one time. And then uh, we say federally recognized because you're a federally recognized native nation if you have, if you still have a treaty with the Congress. Now, 
We were once, as I say, a thousand. We're now 574 federally recognized. And if you think about the federal recognition, so ask, here were the Pawnee, the Osage, the Kaw, they're now here. And we can see through every treaty, a broken treaty, made the land a little smaller. And of course, the Killers of the Flower Moon talks about when they moved them there and they are an oil rich land, then the Congress sends <coughs> protectors for the women because it's matriarchal. I'm from a matriarchal society. The women make the rules a lot of times and highly respected. So that's probably why we don't all speak the same language. Um, well, it is why. And then, you know, we get caught with people playing natives and um, they look pretty cute. Uh, historical exclusions, there were a lot of them. And, you can, and it, not just for us. The uh, Chinese uh, and then uh, voting. I will tell you, my, my huge grandmother was able to vote in 1938. She voted for FDR. So there was part of the counties in Colorado that did allow natives to vote, but the whole state didn't um, until 1948. But generally, everybody in 1957. Um, I think it was 1949 for Arizona. And then just think of the other exclusionary laws and policies. I was right the first time we even had to codify <laughs> white supremacy here. I thought that was interesting. And then if you think of Bureau of Indian Affairs, we still talk about that. The sole purpose, which was part of the War Department on, uh, at one time, if you read the founding documents of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, its sole purpose was to liquidate the savage Indian. And one of the ways we liquidated was boarding schools. And you know, not just on the United States, but in Canada too. I always feel for these children because they look so frightened. And then this is Haskell. You know, Billy Mills, we found out he was a great Olympic runner during his time at Haskell boarding school. And one of the ways they found out he was such a great runner is he'd run home to Oklahoma on the weekends <laughs> after he was in the boarding school. Yeah, so heck, that guy's a good runner. Let's put him in the Olympics. Um, and legislation, sovereignty. We, we work for sovereignty and self-determination, but until Congress gives us our land on our reservations, Congress holds our reservations in trust. So we'll never own that land, even if we have a house on there, on our reservation. And the other thing, Congress controls commerce on, on Native American reservations. That's in Article 8 of the, uh, the Articles of Confederation. Because of that, we can't have any sort of manufacturing. We're working around that in agriculture. And then in the late 70s, Congress decided, well, we'll let you have casinos. That'll be a way for you to raise money. And you know, what do we know about running casinos? But, um, and our children go to school, mostly at public schools where they're not going to learn anything about their people. Um, but we are restoring, we're doing a lot about it. Uh, we're trying to change. There are still Bureau of Indian Education, like Haskell is a BIE. And that's part of the Department of Interior and, Ag and the Department of Agriculture. Um, extent, or, uh, native schools didn't become part of the land grant system until 1992. Remember the agricultural experiment station was 1883 and 1890. They let the historically black uh, universities into the land grant system, 1992 for native schools. So we have tribal education departments and we still have Bureau of Indian Education departments on those schools. And of course, the teaching, American progress, when she's in the dark here, look what happens as she goes by. It's just what we have. We learn and we're socialized to these things. So if you don't know these things, it's because you were socialized not to know them and it was left out of your edu education. I use this slide because it's from um, Royal Valley Schools and a quarter of their population is Native students from Prairie Band, Potawatomi, and others. And this was their chart, and I thought, 
quarter of your population is this, but you call them other. You have a name for here, here, and here. But a quarter of your students are othered. So we're trying to get them to actually put what that might mean. Yeah, it's, it's a process. And then we're addressing things like the mascot issues. And I know a lot of people don't really want to talk about those. But let's get to the book. Um, what are some of the things that really popped out to you about the book? What did you learn? Anybody? I loved her stories about growing up, like the strawberry story ah. with her grandfather, and uh, I, I just and the uh, yeah the walk uh, the pecans, yes. and the fact that pecan is not actually that kind of nut, but all nuts. Yes. So, so did she give you a sense of honoring of oh, the natural world? Absolutely. Reciprocity. Reciprocity. What else about the natural world on why we don't call it resources? Resources is an extractive term. If you grant personhood to every living thing in the natural world, you'll think twice about chopping it down or only taking or taking all of it rather than sharing leaving some for the next person or the next uh, animal, any, you know, all of those kinds of things that you do when you don't, uh, when you call it, it, when you say it, like a tree. Um, I took issue with the Kansas Forest Service. They just had an open house about a month ago, and their little card, from seed to saw, and so I said, what about seed to shade? How about seed to sequestration? How about seed to survival? And all of these things. And then I sent them a picture of a, a wind tower. And these sheep are standing under it. And it's, it's got a, a, a shadow long, as a windmill might, those wind towers. And the sheep are all under that little bit. So that's why trees are important, because of all the things that so if you're only thinking of a forest as something to cut down, that might be an issue. Have any of you read Theodore Canton's The Native American and U.S. Forest Service? He's a biology professor for the uh, Montana State University or the University of Montana, I can't remember which one, but he wrote, a, and he writes for the U.S. Forest Service. And he talks about all of the ways you, you show up it looks like these people are farming in a forest and they've burned a little bit to make way for the farming to put more carbon back. But they could, they could have a lot more if they just cut the whole forest down. So his premise throughout the book, if we would have continued to follow the stewardship practices of the native people that we met, we would have never had a dust bowl. We wouldn't have had most of the calamities, environmental calamities that we have because we're an extractive economy rather than a partnership economy. How do we change that? Not sure at this point, but slowly it's yard by yard, taking up your grass that you're not uh, poisoning so it doesn't get weeds. Uh, one of the things that's really important to us is purslane, and it's a little succulent that you see growing out of sidewalks. How often do people kill that? It has more nutritional value, more iron, and more vitamin C than spinach or kale. And it's wonderful. Uh, my grandma always cooked it in a different way, put it in the beans or whatever. And um, so just those kinds of things. I know I used to take issue with extension. They listed amaranth as a weed. So do you know how long amaranth kept people alive before you all showed up? It's not a weed. We made flour out of it. And so anyway, it's just a different. And she talks about the Three Sisters Garden. Do you remember what she talks about? One of my students who's about to graduate with her master's in um, horticulture. She's from the Navajo Nation. And so she's doing the Three Sisters Garden and talking about that. Do you remember what she talked about in the book? How 
uh, her student was talking about why the Three Sisters is important. And the first time she presented it, one of the professors on the committee said, oh, nothing, this is nothing. So then when they took it, she writes that chapter, as you recall, the same way we would lay out our dissertation or your master's thesis, the same way. And so when she laid it out that way, and the professors that were doubters, they go, ah, oh, you are adding something to the, to the knowledge base. And so they, they had to be shown in, in a different way, in a way that, that they understood. So you write the whole chapter. I just was so thrilled with that. Isn't she a gorgeous writer, too? She has just such beautiful ways of writing. And if you listen to her voice, she has the most calming voice. If you do the audio book, oh, it's beautiful. I was in a workshop with her last year. It was on Zoom. And yeah, I noticed that too, but I should listen to it. I've yeah, it's wonderful. wonderful. So what are some of the other points that came up for you in reading this book? Yes. I found it interesting that you talked about breaking the sweet that That was important to do it between two people. That was the best way. Yeah. It was to be, but that resonated as that relationship. Are any of you familiar with um, Inuit, uh, Alaskan Natives, I think more than one village does it this way. They have a singing that they do, the women hold each other, and they look at each other, and they have these really great sounds that come out of them. It's almost like, well, it's like throat singing, if you've ever heard Tuvan throat singing, or throat singing from the Altai Mountains, which is between uh, China and Mongolia, there's the Altai Mountains. Um, and they have this way of just bringing up this thing. Well, they, they do that, and they get into each other's rhythm. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's just gorgeous. Like I don't I don't know how to do that. But they hold on to each other and they sing back and forth, and they're so in sync with each other that it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous sound. There's a movie. Are any of you familiar with Farley Mowat? He's from Saskatchewan, and he wrote uh, Never Cry Wolf. He also wrote Gorillas in the Mist about Diane Fossey. Well, he wrote a book called The Snow Walker, and it's that story, and they made it into a movie, of the natural healing processes that, that the natives know. And uh, it's really beautiful because if you get the CD, uh, or the DVD, there's a section of the little star that she's the little native woman that helps the pilot that crashes taking her to get treated for tuberculosis. He crashes and she saves his life because he has no idea how to survive in that wild snow and everything. And at the end it shows her with her sister singing that way. So if you ever get a chance, I don't remember the name of it so you could probably look it up on YouTube. What was that term again? What's that? What was that term? I don't know what it is. A throat singing. Oh, okay. You could put throat singing of Alaskan natives, and that might help you find it. Because usually throat singing would come from Mongolia, the Altai, and the Tubans. So throat singing from Alaskan natives might be the way. It's beautiful. So I wrote some, a few notes for myself. She talks a lot about original instruction. What do you suppose that means? Do you remember that from the book? It's on uh, Maple Nation. I think it's in there. So the trees know what to do. The trees know when to stop their um, sap flow. That's original instruction. So now if you want to trim your trees, now's the time. I am always pruning trees on campus because I see those things coming out. That's not good for the tree. And so I have clippers on my desk. And I take walks. I call myself a gorilla pruner because they'll be much more healthy when you cut them from the bottom. A lot of tree trimmers don't know that. They'll cut it off. And, no, you're supposed to cut it next to the trunk. So the natural instruction to that tree is stop flowing my sap. Save it. That's my energy that I'm going to need next spring to make my leaves come out. So she talks about the natural instruction, how much animals, like the deer, like right now they're not too, uh, they're a little crazy right now because it's about to start the rut. Yeah. <laughs> and the males get a case of the stupid, you know, and you see them out in the middle of the day and you're going, 
I know what you're doing. Go back. You're a crepuscular animal. You're not supposed to be out during the day. Uh, so anyway, it's it's just one of those things. All that you know that that urge to breathe. But that's natural instruction too. When people say you have intuition, that's a natural instruction to you. And when you're when you're walking and all of a sudden you jump out of the way and then stuff comes by, that was some natural instruction to you. We don't always listen to those voices, but they're there. You'll see it more in little children than you will adults because we're, we have so much going on, we forget to listen to that natural instruction sometime, which we call intuition. She talks a lot about to have a life, a life has to be, has to be given. Well, when I cut down, when I, a life had to be given because we pulled it up from the roots, but you're gonna give life because you're gonna replant it. Or you're gonna give life because you're going to bless your house with this. And those are very strong things for us, blessing the house. Now I have to tell you, I am not a sweet grass. I, I'm Okiawinge, that would be considered a Southwest native, and we're not sweet grass people. This is mostly from the plains and the east. Um, we are cedar and sage people. So when I have my sage bundle, I have it with cedar and I might bless my house. I had a, an iffy visitor not too long ago, so I, I saved my house. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to do that. I thought, wow. Oh, anyway, <laughs> my friend brought him. <laughs> Who is this guy? Um, the natural world is both friend, or both uh, medicine and relative. How is it medicine? Does anybody know what digitalis is? Does anybody know what digitalis treats? Heart conditions. Heart conditions. Yeah. Where did digitalis come from? Yeah, it's a plant. And so pharmaceuticals get to take that and replicate it by its chemical compounds, and they make it, and they spend a lot, they charge a lot of money for it, right? Even though it's your life-giving thing, and you don't maybe know where to go find digitalis, so you can buy it in a pill, but they will want to make sure you're going to pay them for it. So everything that's a pharmaceutical has a natural compound that it was taken from, right? Okay. Another way, uh, speaking of commodities. Okay, so when we were removed, do you still need this? I mean, am I? Can you hear me? Okay. It's off. Because I. Oh yeah, that's right. I tend to. I was kind of anchored there. I tend to walk around. And I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, we're talking about medicines. Oh, medicines and gifts. Um, so if we see everything we extract from the natural world as a gift rather than a commodity, would that change our point of view? And yes, we want to live a comfortable life in our retirement, but, and so it does take that you have to earn some money, put it away, uh, but I think sometimes we are measured on how much money we have. I'm a trustee for the Nature Conservancy, and one of my beautiful colleagues on that said to me, or said to the group one day, well, you know, people in Johnson County are just more generous than everyone else. And I said, well, the median income is 95000 a year, and the rest of Kansas is about fifty six. So are you just more generous, or do you just have more money to give? I, I have been about maples. Maples. Yeah. Oh, and, and natural instruction. Yeah. And you know, here's something I want to say. Um, one of the things that we've collected, and she does talk about it, she goes into quite a bit, the original Thanksgiving address. And Thanksgiving being a, 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 an idea adopted from the people, and how uh, every year. So she attributed it to the Notione. Nation, which is a combination of more than one. But if I could, I'd just like to read the first one so we can bring ourselves back. <laughs> Today we've gathered, and when we look upon the faces around us, we see that the cycles of life continue. We've been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. So now let us bring our minds together as one as we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. 
Now our minds are one. Now our minds are one. <laughs> okay. So this goes on and on because you give thanks to each of uh, all your relatives in the natural world. One of the things we say when we begin anything is mitakuya seoasi. It's to all my relations. Because relations could be all of you here related to me. It could be the uh, this little guy growing up from the concrete as a relation. It's something from the natural world. Even fire is a relation. <laughs> my heart's still beating. <laughs> I'm trying to compose myself. Oh, I just thought, okay, I think we were talking about extractive um, economy versus a partnership economy. That was one of the things we were talking about. And we, and we continue to see the difference in what an extractive economy can do to an overall economy. Because eventually, if you take and take and take and never give back, what's going to happen? You run out. Would you do that to a relative? Would you call Aunt Bessie and say, yeah, I want all your money. Just give it to me now. Aunt Bessie wouldn't be very excited about that. But if you're going to treat Aunt Bessie as an it that you just take money from, you're not. she's going to run out and so are you. So somehow this concept of stewardship is a really important part. And someone had a quote from the book. Which one of you said that? That's one of the great quotes that she had from the book. So original instruction, we talked about that. And um, I'm just kind of, Thank you. I don't know I'm for a minute here. I really will go back to you. There was one other thing I wanted to talk about. Oh, it versus personhood, gifts and uh, life. Oh, a life given for a life. So we talked a little bit about that. Can you think of anything that you do or you have that didn't require a life. I'm wearing cotton. It was extracted. And that living plant gave its life so I could wear this vest. Well, if you think about even plastic, that requires life. In the past, yeah. Just the past. Yeah. Yeah. Fossil fuel. Uh, maybe something like limestone. Well, there's life in limestone. Well, I think limestone, but. Yes, one still comes from life. Yep, everything. But some of your harder rocks, maybe not. There was life in there at one time. If you think of a volcano, there was life in fire. And then, and then the natural, the minerals compressed. How many of you are wearing diamond? Think of, I don't have any diamonds on. Oh, here's turquoise. <laughs> I don't think of fire as life myself, but maybe it is. Well, there's certainly yeah. something to it. Yeah, I remember burning something that was alive. Uh huh. Well, when the wind doesn't uh, it regenerate, you know, like carbon. This, yeah. We yeah. need carbon. Well, and then when they do the burns out in what uh, eastern Kansas, uh huh. And then it brings the, the grass back better. Brings the grass back. So yeah, it's it's life producing. It's energy producing. Energy yeah. is life. You need, you need energy for life. Uh, our brains, we're, we're electrical human beings. We're electrical beings. So we have plumbing and we have electricity. <laughs> so uh, if you think about our plumbing, our hearts. Our hearts have plumbing and our hearts have electricity all the time. But we wear shoes and so it shorts us out every day. We have an incomplete electrical circuit. So how do we get that to complete itself? That's right. Take your shoes off and play in the dirt. How many of you garden? Is it therapeutic to you? Having your hands in there and then you grow something, you eat it, all of these things. Why do you say incomplete electrical circuit if you have shoes Because it stops the current. Until I take my shoes off in the soil, my current isn't complete. Electricity needs a full current. When it's grounded, it stops. So I'm grounding myself in the shoes. Yeah, 
Yeah, read about that. It's uh, the grounding in our electrical bodies. Uh, in fact, they even have some things that you could put your feet on. You have to take your shoes off, and that completes this. this. Okay, so what's the difference between soil and dirt? Microbes and nutrients. Which one has which? Soil. Dirt. Not so much, but you still need it, right? It's, it is useful. We make bricks out of things like that. But if you think about everything has a life of some kind, or what we have, even my synthetic here is what? And if you think of the natural elements in the world, the, the stones, which the rocks, all of those things that come from this compressed power, and that's how those are. So just, and that's a whole new mindset. If you're every day thinking about extraction, it's really hard to come back to stewardship and partnership. It really is. Uh, because so much of what we're measured on is extraction. How much did we extract? How much did we extract from the economy? Or did we take care of things? You know, there's just, it, it's changed. And that's always a process of colon, colonization. Every, every community in the world, collective population, is usually colonized by an individualistic population. But that's a worldwide uh, phenomenon. And you had a great story about the colonization of different peoples. Uh, I, I performed a wedding, and, and the bride's name was Welch. So I always do research in the names, because I find that it tells you who they are. Um, and her last name was Welch, his last name was Hernandez. So the Welch, uh, the Brits called anyone that was foreign Welsh or Welch. Um, the names that came from Spain, you can tell what they did. H-E-R is, a, is a, um, a Castilian word for iron. So the Hernandez, E-Z, E-S, and O-S, were Christian suffixes. So, during the Inquisition, if I'm a Muslim and my name is Alvar, I might become Alvarez, to look Christian. If, during the Inquisition, I happen to be Jewish, and my name is Martin, then I become Martinez. So start looking at the ends of those names. So the Hernandez were the, uh, or they pronounced the Z with that sound, Hernandez. They were the Christian ironsmiths. So that's why there are so many Hernandez that came because everybody needed an ironsmith. The Herrera, if you've ever heard that name, came from the Galician part of, if you look at the Iberian Peninsula, this part that's above Portugal is Galicia. That was the Celtic region of Spain and the Jewish region of Spain. And the Herrera were the Jewish ironsmiths. So just like Miller, or John's son, son of John. All of those names have suffixes to tell what their, their, um, what their occupation was. And people don't speak Spanish because of Mexico. <laughs> That's something I hear a lot. They speak Spanish because of Spain. And it's called Castilian, but it's now called Spanish because it was a very different language at one time. In the 13th century, it was called Castile, the, the country was called Castile, Leon. King Alfonso X, the father of Castilian, made it Castilian, the language. And then that became Spain. Um, I do a show for uh, High Plains Public Radio called The Cantigas de Santa Maria. And it's a musical biography of King Alfonso X. They usually play it on Christmas Day, but I think last year he played it on Friday, so if you get a chance, listen to it. But it's all that history of, of him. And I think I, I started really studying that because I was a music historian for one thing, but I was trying to realize why the people in what is now New Mexico and the, and the, the indigenous people had Spanish last names. Well, they landed in 1535 and started taking slaves and wives and all that sort of thing. So that's why many of them have that last name. My mother's last name was Ferreira, so they were Jewish, uh, Jewish ironsmiths. Anyway, um, I think we're done. <laughs> I've kind of lost track of what I was talking about. Uh, History is always an important part to any geographer. 
everything we do is geography. So if I could promote geography. I work with Dr. Lysachenko, who's on campus, um, the Florida State University, and we have the Kansas Geographic Alliance. And so our job is to uh, help high school teachers mostly be better geography teachers. Because it's not all about memorizing <laughs> capitals and waterways. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> yes? So if I'm referring to people who lived here before, how should I refer to them? What's the proper way? What do you prefer? You know, if you don't know their nation, you like I showed you before, was the Pawnee. Um, we like to be called by our nation if, and if all possible. I think Indian is probably the last thing. Indigenous, uh, First Americans, so we were here before it was called America. Um, but I think, you know, just call us something, <laughs> not like for dinner. No, but Indian is probably the worst name because Columbus thought he was in India and that's why he called us Indians. And and so then there was a, someone said, are you an Indian with a feather or a feather of, or an Indian with a dot? And I go, well, we're not all about feathers and drums. <laughs> Some of us didn't do feathers, you know, so you can't really say that either. But um, First Americans, original people, indigenous, there's a lot of different things, but nation is always the best. Like, this is my friend, uh, Deborah Bolton. She's Okiawinge. If that's important, it would be nice if we could just be people, not always be. But if, but there are times you're going to need to do that. Yeah. But ask. Don't assume. <laughs> yes. I just learned about the book a couple days ago. So I was expecting you to braid sweetgrass. I would have, but I'm not a braid, uh, not a braider. I. That's not from my people. I was invited to do this because I'm indigenous and we have a lot of these natural practices. Uh, now my good friend here brought some and as she said, this isn't ready to be because, well it is, but someone will hold the end and then someone else will braid it and then you, shall we just do that? Here, you hold this end, let's do that. Um, but, and everyone, most people know how to braid. And so what she would do, and, and then we would take one of these and tie it around the end. So you would braid it. I would have if somebody would have asked me. <laughs> so we braid it. Oops, see, I'm not very good at it. I left the <laughs> strand out. Because <laughs> you didn't have anyone to hold it. No, so I did actually. I <laughs> Uh, now for tonight of uh, this reception for Ryan Redcorn and the artists that are displaying it right now, Norman Akers, he's from KU and I think he's, I can't, excuse me, I can't remember what uh, nation he's from. So they asked me to make medicine bundles for them. Now it, a medicine bundle would be a bag, probably they didn't want to spend, the, they couldn't spend the money, they didn't have much. Um, um, a, a, a deerskin canned hide. You would hand someone a, a small bag and it would have um, uh, sage, tobacco, and uh, uh, cedar in it. So when I would make a medicine bundle for me, I would <laughs> tie sage and, and cedar together. And then you sprinkle um, uh, tobacco. We do tobacco blessings, but that's not because we're smoking it or anything, or though we might. Uh, it's to give the natural world back to itself. And so that's what this is. You're using the natural world for your blessings. But that's a terrible, terrible <laughs> braid. <laughs> but you would do it on one end. And then you would dry it in the window seal or someplace like that. Thank you, Smoke. Now you can see why it's called sweet grass. Isn't that beautiful? And sage is fragrant too. Tobacco is wonderfully fragrant. These are fragrant gifts that we give back in ceremonies, blessings, whatever. My sister-in-law just had thyroid surgery, so I had a fire for her, and I blessed, and I prayed, and, and for a speedy recovery. You had a question? Just curious if in this area, the Plains people were sage cedar. 
And you can't really, for as much as everyone traveled, it's hard to say what was what. Um, I'll give you another example. We have things, that, berries. Whatever berry was to us, we make something called wojapi. And my wojapi was made of choke cherry. And that's high in vitamin C. If you look, maybe a Plains native upper north might be blueberries or uh, cranberries for their wojapi. pea. What, kind, what would we make wojapi pea in Kansas? Yes, plums. There might be some choke cherries. I get, I get my choke cherries off campus. They have no idea what that is. So I'm always, <laughs> I am I'm a forager and campus is a great foraging place. Uh, but yeah, so the sand plums and prairie plums are really at high in vitamin C. So we would cook that up with whatever kind of sweetener you might have, and then it's poured on uh, your fry bread. Fry bread was a direct uh, uh, descendant of our commodities. We didn't know what to do with white flour, so we made fry bread out of it. Oh, and lard. Okay, hi. <laughs> We're no, done. No, I got one oh, more. Okay. Okay, one more question. <laughs> she was asking about braiding the, the grass. Isn't there a curing process that you do before you braid it so it doesn't break down? I don't know that. Um, now, I think most of the people I know braid it as green and then put it like and in a dry. windowsill to dry. Well, I think there is also you. You can boil it and then. Uh, oh. you know, I know they do soap. that for reed baskets. And then put it in cold water. Ah. Let it dry and then put it in. Thank you. But a lot of different ways to do Sure. Um, now they do cure tobacco because you hang it. If you're going to smoke it at all, you hang it and then you smoke it. At, you know, you build a fire in it to dry it, and that's the natural smoking process. Uh, smoke to give it flavor. Um, uh, I had an anthropologist living with me a few years ago while he was doing some research in Southwest Kansas, and um, I grew tobacco that year. So he he was from a tobacco farm in Kentucky, so he was showing me how to do that. It's not necessarily something that we would have done. He said, and that makes it more fragrant, and if you want to smoke it, that's what we did, <laughs> but, well, sometimes we did. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's good. That's good information to have. I want to make three quick acknowledgments. First, uh, Humanities Kansas, who uh, brought Deborah with a grant. Uh, they do you know, things for us about every other month we've got something going on. This is kind of a joint project with the Kinsley Public Library. They had an event here that a month ago. We had food, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we had three sisters stew and we it was have, a Sunday though. We have Dylan's muffins over here. <laughs> <laughs> I just talked about that. <laughs> and, and then I also wanted to acknowledge that the Schmidt Foundation, you know the Schmidt Foundation a couple of years ago helped fund this area, this common space. Um, over the last three years, they've given us um, $10,000 a year for engaging efforts in this space, whether that be programming, flowers, things like that. So that's why we choose to have some programs out here in this space to make it more engaging. So we want to thank them. And then of course, thank you, Deborah, for coming. This is fantastic. Oh, and I can't wait to work with you again on something. <laughs> yeah, well, I promise you. I can't promise you. Yeah. I'm going to take credit that my lecture was so hot. Are the grading sweetgrass or smoking sweetgrass? Oh, yeah. Smoking hot. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you.